Welcome to Ultra Life Today. Today we're going to be joined by a dear friend of mine, uh, somebody that I uh, grew to uh, know and love in the biotech community back in my early days here in Oklahoma. Um, Deb Morad. Deb, how are you? Doing great, and it's a pleasure to be here, Adam. Yep. Um, always a pleasure uh, working and sitting beside someone that I grew up with as well in this. In yeah, this we business. kind of grew up together in the in the biotech uh, kind of mid 2005, 2008. We kind of were interacting with each other. So we've been um, we Deb here. We've been talking to a number of key opinion leaders and people in the field of wellness and health over time. You know, the the first thing that we really want to uh, explore with people is why biotech, why health. You know, let, let's. Do you mind if we we scroll back the wayback machine here <laughs> and go into kind of your DNA? Why did you even get involved in in health and wellness back in the beginning? Was there some impetus? Uh, and and a little bit. Do you, what you, do you have an M, uh, a master's or a PhD? Or where are you at? In, in so that I kind of explain how I got into this crazy mess. Okay. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I um, my grandfather actually um, he did a lot of work through Shrine Hospital volunteer work. And wait, um, which, which where were you at at this point? Um, I was he? in Norman, Oklahoma. Oh um, wow! So here in Oklahoma. And he, so there's not a Shrine Hospital here, um, but there is J D McCarty Center. Um, and it focuses with kids with special needs. And then Shrine okay. Hospital works a lot with children with special needs. And so I think when I was younger, when I was in elementary school, I was the kid that didn't have a fit on career day. And so, <laughs> <laughs> and so my grandparents, um, I think it was like this pointing out that you're going to be a doctor. And I volunteered with my grandfather. So was, that was the expectation, was that you're going to be a doctor? It was, totally was. I mean, I don't even think I had a choice. I loved research. <laughs> I loved putting things together. Um, I also had a knack but, for the business uh, so, side. But why, what, why, what, I mean, was there other doctors in the family with, that you're in? <laughs> I mean, typically when somebody's kind of that's your expected path is because mom and dad are doctors, grandpa's a doctor, grandma was a doctor, your cousins and uncles are all in medicine. You know, I, I would say that my grandparents and, you know, even 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 my mom and my brother, my whole family, I think they saw a spark that was something oh, different. OK. And I, genuinely, when you think of the physician path, you think of I want to help people and make a difference. Right? Absolutely. And so working or, alongside or at least you hope that that's you there. hope <laughs> to make a difference. And okay. so working alongside with my grandfather, I just love science and putting things uh, together. It really resonated and fit with me. Um, but I also didn't really understand how you, you know, take, you know, later I learned, obviously, but how you take a technology and move it forward and commercialize it. And so I started this track. Um, actually, I was going to be a cardiovascular surgeon, which we know, wow. I, which we know that I'm not. <laughs> and I did all yeah. the things that I was to do. I, I, you know, have an undergrad in biochem. I took all the pre-med courses. Took took everything, you know, to go to med school. So and you, you were on the track. I was I was on the track. You could not. I mean, I was going strong, and it was a very hard day for my family when I came home. And in fact, I was in Oklahoma City. Yeah. And Tom Walker, which was over at I two E at the time, and there was a few others. They were like, "Well, you do know if you." work with the university patent. I was actually in the Office of Research at the University of Oklahoma doing all the things I needed to do for med school, right? Yeah. Having the perfect resume. Yeah. And the story really resonated with me. Of so who to, who, to, who shared the story of of uh, biotech development to you and, and that whole pathway? Who? I, I had an, I don't think anyone had experienced the full pathway. Sure, sure. <laughs> because, but I, Somebody I heard, told the story. But, or... they heard, they, I, but I heard enough of it, which was there's patents inside the university. Yeah. You can take that patent and make a company. And a light went off, right? Oh, wow. And long and behold, you know, from that point, um, and I did, I ended up getting, um, my master's in business because people do not think a scientist is very good at business, <laughs> but I think I've proven them wrong. And it's true. It's true, actually. Yeah. The, the and it's it's I've seen more scientists try to do business and and ultimately just say that's not my bailiwick, right? Because it's not. It doesn't follow the their the way that the most scientists think. 
but there are some unusual scientists. Like I think we know a couple. Yeah, we know we do. We definitely <laughs> know a few. Yeah, yeah. It's, but so you went, you got your master's. Mm -hmm. But there was that a sad day you said when you came back to your parents and and you said I, I did. I'm not gonna be a doctor. Yes, <laughs> that was probably. I mean, my grandfather called me Doctor Debbie oh, for wow. like a number of years, and so that was really hard. Oh. Um, I sat at the children's table for a very long time for holidays. And I think after a while, um, and <laughs> they finally understood what I was doing, and then they were proud. I think it just, it took a while to break that mold. But I think, you know, and this is why I was so happy to be on the show with you today, because there could be someone, a parent or a grandparent, or even someone that was in my shoes that didn't fit inside that box, the right? The doctor box. The doctor box or the physician box. And, but then you have a love for research and you love these things. And I don't think my grandparents or my mom or anyone in my family could really articulate anything but physician. Uh, and so once they- Because that's all that they knew. They didn't know that there was this whole entrepreneurial path yes. that was, a, was really so much more about discovery and new science and possibilities. I think you know what 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 grabbed my heart because you know um, my early days in biotech. I I had uh, I got my MBA back in '94, right from Babson. He, he's only 27, by the way. If you guys are doing math. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I I I, uh, I focused. I was in advertising and marketing. I worked for Young and Rubicam Advertising from 94 to 97. They sent me to Moscow. And so I was part of the, the, the post-Soviet uh, restructuring of, of the whole country. I mean, I don't, Russia is so ambivalent right now to the West, but we're really, we're, the United States, is, it's, it's ironic to me because we invested as a country so much into helping Russia get out of the Soviet mindset and into an entrepreneurial mindset. And it's a really unfortunate what's happened since then. Um, I left Russia in 2003. My last job, I was the head of marketing for the number two financial institution in Russia, right? So I was doing high level marketing, public relations. Um, and the only reason why I moved back to the States was because my first wife got into family medicine residency here in Oklahoma. Oh, wow. And she didn't want to live in Russia anymore. So she's like, either we have a family in America or you can kiss your family goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, it, it wasn't exactly like that. But that's how it felt to me. Um, and so I moved here. I, I dropped everything that I was doing back, back there. And I was a fish out of water. You know, uh, I, I didn't know what I was going to do. Thankfully, a guy named Bill, Bill Hagstrom uh, took pity on me. <laughs> He was, um, he's the guy that built, helped build Research Park. Yes, I, I'm, I know who Bill is. You know Bill. Yeah, yes. Bill, our audience doesn't know Bill. Bill Hagstrom is one of the reasons why Research Park was developed. He was CEO of, core on, of not Core Oncology, of, um, oh, your, the, the urology company that's uh, up there, Uricor, that eventually was acquired by LabCor um, as a, uh, a technology that was able to measure cancer in people with prostate cancer. Really, it was a new technology. But Bill took me under his wing because he wanted to start a biotech incubator, and he was my mentor. He, the only reason why I am even able to function in biotech was because Bill needed somebody with a quantitative business background, which I had, because he didn't know how to build business models and all that stuff. And I was able to come alongside him, and we were able to do great things. But what really caught my heart, and the, this is a long preamble, to what you were saying, Deb, is that I, the, the, the beauty and the, uh, the opportunity to see a technology that was being worked on in a lab by a creative, brilliant scientist and see that there was a real world application to what was being developed that could fundamentally change the lives of thousands or maybe even millions of people is so much more energizing than anything that I've ever been involved in in my life. You know, the opportunity to change somebody's life for the better, to have an impact on, on whether, they are, whether their hearts and their soul and their family is going to be sad and broken, to their heads are lifted up, 
and they have hope and they have a, an opportunity to live, that's so much more better than anything that I could ever apply in my life. So I threw myself into biotech, which sounds like you did too. Oh, no, most definitely. And, you know, I am very thankful um, for having the experience in Oklahoma. Uh, a lot of people say, you know, you need to move to the, the West Coast or the East Coast to yep. make things happen. I've, I've been very successful. I've lived in Oklahoma the entire time. I've traveled a lot, <laughs> but I have lived here the entire time. But if I would not have been in Oklahoma, I would not have had the experiences with Oklahoma Medical Research Foundation, working with OKN007, bringing that from you know bench to bedside, which basically means animal research to the clinic. Um, you know that was the first. So who, IND. whose lab was that? That, 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 that so we're talking we're talking about the technology that uh, nature technology adopted yes or is this something no, different that o omrf was actually completely different i mean omrf was like this is back early days okay early, um, okay. so this was the first this this is the story that the things i would never do again now at this point in my <laughs> okay. career so um OMR help, us, help us understand yeah so omrf had a repurposed drug for glioblastoma and it was out licensed. You probably remember this story if it resonates. It's actually something we could do a whole show. Was this on Larry this. Kennedy and and uh, Real and Bob Floyd and Bob, Flau uh, Bob, Bob Floyd, Floyd, Real Towner. Yeah. Um, so they the, they actually went into some clinical studies with this. So thing, this is an amazing story. So let me tell okay, you this. Yeah, I mean, go this for is, it. So this is the, I'm actually happy to have this, and I'll go through this quickly. I know we have only so much time on this show. So this technology um, was uh, licensed out to AstraZeneca. They went to a phase three trial with it for stroke. It was deemed like a placebo, so they didn't know why it worked or not. OMRF got the rights back to the technology. Because they shelved it. Because they shelved it. And so when I was at OMRF, they, they gave me just a list of items to do. And they're like, you know, if we were able to get the drug product back. And so for those on, like listening on the air, making a drug costs so much money. Millions. Millions of dollars. And so I was able to get the drug product back that was AstraZeneca used for the stroke trial. Um, wow, that's, I actually, that's priceless, it's, actually. It's priceless. And when I say there's things I wouldn't do again, at that point in my career, you know, I was the person, it was, I worked with a consultant, uh, Kirk Maples, and we were doing everything. We didn't have a lot of money. So we were doing everything. He would give me instructions. He knew the story of the drug. And it's like, hey, call AstraZeneca, see if you can get this drug back. They shipped it back. It was in these cold, I mean, the material, everything it took for the shipping material for this is more money than we had because we had zero oh my money. Gosh. Um, I bought a refrigerator um, from Home Depot. Oh my and gosh. I put that refrigerator <laughs> um, in, <laughs> in a, a, like a storage place at OMRF. And you go through and you make an SOP. You do all the work. Um, I had never filed an IND in my whole entire life. And um, what an IND is, is you basically apply for the FDA so you can treat patients with your right. with your drug, right? I had a consultant, which was Kirk Maples, and we went through every single thing. It was four giant boxes in the end of the day when we assembled this. It was four boxes, um, basically four times four of this, like 27 three ring binder things that was sent to the FDA. Because you got through. all of the data from AstraZeneca. Because we got all the data from AstraZeneca. You had AstraZeneca. all the preclinical toxicology. All the pre everything. Everything. And so, so when we got the drug back, we did have to make sure it was still good. Right. Um, and then, long and behold, um, you know, and, and I think this kind of goes to my background. Sure. You know, because I did, it's not like, you know, I have students ask me, well, what classes do I take? Well, there isn't a class to take, but I wanted to, I mean, I believed I was going to be a physician. That's what I was going St at for. At this point still? No, at this point I didn't, but I worked so hard at that point. I think I had, I knew enough of the clinical setting. I actually um, worked with sponsored research agreements. And so I knew how all those things were put together. Wow. And so it just pieced all over. I mean, I walked over to the University Stevenson Cancer Center, OU Health Stevenson Cancer Center was just opened. And I essentially was just like, who would like to help me with the clinical trial? <laughs> That's not how things work. So who, I'm curious, who stepped up over at Stevens? Did anybody? So I still work with Dr. James Batiste. Okay. And um, he's actually the new company, which we'll talk a little bit about. Um, so J Dr. Batiste is amazing um, physician and researcher with glioblastoma. 
Wow. I've been friends with him now um, a number of years. And he was really instrumental to get things going. I also think when you have a new research center, everyone is just happy there's someone that wants to come in the door. <laughs> they don't have that problem, you know, yeah. 10 years later. But sure. actually that uh, compound, OKN007, so since that point, it was licensed out to an investment company from OMRF. And it's still treating patients today. Wow. And that's it's remarkable. So it, has it, is it actually in clinical use? It's it, it's still in clinical trial. Okay. And so we got it in clinical trial. It's still in clinical trial. It has not been But people are using it for, um, for like. For glioblastoma, yes. That's amazing. And it's in our state of Oklahoma, which is, is, is exciting. So um, we're going to come right back after this break and we're going to continue this dialogue. Um, my name is Adam Payne and this is Ultra Life Today. Our mission is to take nature's most beloved botanicals and enhance them with our liquid protein scaffold technology. This helps it reach your cells faster and better. With exponentially enhanced bioavailability, you'll feel better every day. Ultra Botanica, the feel-good curcumin. Welcome back to Ultra Life Today. My name is Adam Payne, and we're continuing a dynamic interview with Deborah Morad. Deb, you're currently, um, you're the CEO of Corixer Therapeutics. You're the entrepreneur in residence at Cartado Ventures, which is a venture capital fund here, located here in Oklahoma City. Um, your last big deal was with Nature Technology that uh, sold to... Uh, Al Aldervan? Aldervon? Aldervon? Aldervon. <laughs> Aldervon. It's a Danaher com company. And so you've, you've, you're you so busy and so involved both in the fabric of biotechnology here in Oklahoma. And you're, we've been talking about a little bit about your history. So let's uh, let's go back to, let's finish out the story that we were talking about here. We're, it was really getting interesting. So you were we were talking about this uh, glioblastoma drug that you helped to move forward into an IND, and uh, there was nobody to hold your hand. No. Right? <laughs> no. It was kind of like, here's your job, Deb. Take this drug and turn it into a glioblastoma drug. Yeah. Right? right? Well, I, th th I will say the researchers knew they wanted a glioblastoma uh, drug, right? That was Rial Re and Dr. Bob. Dr. Rial Towner and mm. Dr. Um, Bob, Bob Floyd. Floyd. And I know they wanted the, it really just dynamic happened. individuals. Both yeah. of those guys are just top notch people. Amazing. And so for me, you know, I think, you know, people always ask, well, what is it exactly that you do? And I, I think the best way to explain it is, you know, I kind of marry the researcher to the boardroom or the that, clinic, that's, right? That's and, a great, and move that's it a great forward. explanation. And so with them, I mean, they knew, I mean, they had an impressive research. They had all the information about this, but you have to translate it to clinic. And that's really where things are tough. So we were able to move this to clinic. And, you know, if, if I had to go back and say anything to anyone, including myself, is celebrate your success, right? I didn't know how hard it was to file an IND. I didn't know how difficult it was to move something from bench to bedside. I also didn't know a lot of people file an IND and they get a clinical hold. That would have probably changed my mind when I was doing this. <laughs> so but because you did, I was you didn't really gung ho, we didn't get one. We were it was thirty days. They come back, you either get you're good to go or not, and we were good well, to go. Well, they probably didn't even say anything, because if after 30 days, if you don't hear from them, yeah, you're it's, good it's, to go. Yeah, it's great news. <laughs> it's like the one time you really just don't want to hear from anyone. Um, but no, it, it was great. It went to clinical trial. I got to see a lot of things. But then after that, so after you do it one time, you're also, it's like you're just completely charged, and you know. My family still, you know, from the conversation about going to med school, all those things. Were they in shock at the time still? Oh, yeah, they're still mad at me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they, I mean, it's finally, uh. my mom's probably the happiest person right now. And um, she's really excited. Like, I knew this all along, but she, she did uh. not at the time. But so uh. from that point, you know, I worked with various, it's, um, I tell people, if you've seen the movie Hitch with Will Smith, 
Uh, he's like a date doctor and people don't oh. know who he is. And there's like this, he has this card he hands out to people and then people get set up and they get married. So I joke, like I was like the hitch of biotech. <laughs> so you you basically are handed like you're, you even told me you're like, you were kind of off the radar and then all of a sudden, boom, right? Yeah. Well, it was going through that hitch lifestyle, I guess you would say, right? Um, I actually met Nature Technology the team when I was working for the glioblastoma drug with oh, OMRF. So how did that come about? Who who was the Nature Technology team? And give us a little bit of background of what they were doing and what what why was that even interesting to you? Yeah, so Nature Technology, and there were lots of other ventures on the way to Nature Technology. I actually worked um, with one of the largest mergers with another state company um, that people don't really know about, which was Dentsply. It was a dental company. Uh -huh. And they merged with Serona, which was a Swiss company. Oh, it was like, I think, $5.8 billion dental merger. Wow. So I worked with all of their key opinion leaders to merge them together, which um, we could have another show about key opinion leaders. But key opinion leaders basically are what pushes your research forward. So those are very critical in development and moving drugs forward. Yeah, these are the people that actually people listen to. They respect their opinion. That's they, why they're called key opinion leaders, yeah, right? Yeah, I, I, maybe that's – see if I should have went to med school and became <laughs> a key, key opinion leader. No, so Nature Technology, um, it was essentially a founder that did not create the science. He created a lifestyle business, which was a manufacturing company. Oh, interesting. And he was actually friends with Michael Chambers. Chambers that was Aldevron. Okay. And for people, if you Google it, you will notice Aldevron's like one of the largest manufacturing companies for drugs in the world now. And wow. so the founder of Nature Tech was pretty much, I, I don't want to say it was a, it was a friendly competition, but it was like Michael had this manufacturing company. The founder of Nature Tech really saw that, except we were not a GMP facility it was only research grade. Uh, but long and behold, um, there was scientists that worked for Nature Technology that created two amazing techs, HyperGrow, which is a manufacturing process which most CDMOs use uh, to process uh, plasmid, which is used for you know your CAR-T therapies, mRNA. People probably recognize mRNA, mRNA from COVID vaccine, sure. right? So just think about that. And then the vector, so a lot of times with drugs, there has to be a vector for delivery and the things that you use. And they also created the nanoplasmid, which is used, if you Google that, you'll notice that Genentech just licensed that in and is using the nanoplasmid. So that's a that's a pretty big name, too, so, in the pharmaceutical world. So just world. for our listeners here, so um, Nature Technology is making plasmids, which essentially is the delivery mechanism for an uh, uh, maybe an RNA or, or DNA packet of information that you want to deliver somewhere. So the plasmid will, what, adhere to the cell wall, and then it creates a way for it to deliver information into the cell. Is that, is that correct? That's a, that's a, I, I could have had you a couple years ago, Adam, like for some <laughs> media. But yes, and so individuals, when they're going through all these different cell therapies, sure. you know, they have to make this plasma DNA. We, and again, I mentioned like we could not make that for like if someone wanted to go to a clinical trial, we couldn't make that material. They would have to go to Aldevron. So so Aldevron needed your plasma technology. They needed that plasma technology. And, and yes, they, they used it. Obviously, now they really use it because we were purchased basically through Aldevron by Danaher. So Danaher bought Aldevron and also purchased us within the same year. Oh, wow. So they, they saw the writing on the wall that there was a real power to owning both of these entities. Yes. And so... With Nature Tech, it was interesting because I heard, again, this is that Will Smith date doctor method, right? Sure. Um, my card was transferred again, and I sat down with um, Dr. Jim Williams, which is the inventor of the nanoplasmid, brilliant guy, and um, the founder, original founder of Nature Tech. And, you know, you hear that story with the scientists, just like OMRF, you know, Dr. Rial Towner, Dr. Bob Floyd. And they want nothing more than to see people use their technology and make a difference. And that really resonates with me. Yeah. And so at that time, it was funny because it was years later, but they still had my business card from OMRF 
in their wallet oh <laughs> from goodness. when I met them. And I was wow. like, I'm busy right now on this glioblastoma drug. And so I went to work with them and, you know, we had pretty much flatline growth because people were just using nature tech for plasmid services, not the technology. Uh. And within less than three years, um, we translated that from basically a, a I would say a service company to truly people looking at us at a technology company. And obviously it shows with where the technology is housed today. So just very exciting. That sounds like you had to maybe butt a couple of heads to get people to think about who they were and what they're doing differently. It is. And and so that's a, that's the beauty about science, right? Sure. Um, you're continuously, I mean, every single day you're doing something that you're failing at and that's difficult. But you, you have to learn how to fail forward. And so, yes, if you paint your picture that you're at Aldevril and you're this manufacturing company, it is really hard, especially for investors, when people are looking to purchase you or sure. bring this to a bigger picture. Well, you're just a manufacturing company. So we'll pay you a multiplier of what your revenue is. It's like, well, wait a second. I mean, we actually have this really good technology that can impact you know, countless number of people, countless companies all over the world. Yeah, if they had this technology, they would be able to do what they're doing much better. Much better. And so essentially that's what we did. I mean, so when I started with Nature Tech and I, and so I had to just, give... So help, me under, help us understand here. Let's just take a little bit more time on this question. How much better was Nature Technology's plasmid delivery technology than other op options that were out there in the market? Yes, yeah, so a normal manufacturing company that's making plasmid, um, you know, you're seeing 10 to 16 times production with the manufacturing process, the hypergrow. And then the nanoplasmid would help it even further from that. Um, so it's more efficient? More efficient. Also, um, so one of the technologies, not to, we could spend all day on these texts, but the the mini circle is an alternative to a nanoplasmid. Okay. Well, and a, mini a mini circle has been used for years. But what happens is when you go into clinical development, you kind of know that the mini circle isn't the end answer. It, it starts to break down. There's things that happen okay. when you start scaling up in production. So it's not it's not stable. You can't really use this as a drug that would be deployed into a <clears throat> into a, a population. That's right. I mean, it, it can be used, but it's just the effectiveness. So you, when you're manufacturing something, you also want to make it, it's just harder on your manufacturer too. Sure. So to have something, you know, and a resistance factors, all those things in it, the nanoplasma just kind of answered those things. So it was stable. Yep. And it was easier to manufacture from a cost perspective. And it sounds like it was um, in terms of its ability to actually deliver something it was more effective than other solutions that were out there. That's right. And there was, and, and even right now, there's nothing like it. And so you'll see another thing is if you Google the nanoplasmid right now, I'm really anxious to follow that uh, because it's going to be interesting to see what Danaher and Alt Devron do now with this gene therapy bucket that they have because they're really trying to do things from end to end to help people move therapies forward and the nanoplasmid to be part of that. So... Wow. So you're, you've really been a part of this whole revolution, Deb, of uh, the vision of being able to uh, change genetic defects in the human being that, that result in a disease. Uh, like, what, what do you think the top targets are going to be for this kind of thing? So a big thing now will be... Um, I know cystic fibrosis has always been some, a big kind it, of thought leader in, the, uh, in gene therapy. It's huge. So you're going to see all in the gene therapy space, you're seeing a big target for all the rare diseases. Okay. Um, oncology is another one. Oh, that's a, interesting. A, a top c contender. Um, but with rare diseases, you know, we like mentioned... Like the lysosomal storage diseases and things like that. Any, anything, because it makes it more... You know, so a big thing now is, you know, we're treating everyone in bulk. Right. I mean, you're giving like, let's just say you have a headache. We give everyone an Advil or a yeah, Tylenol. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. So these therapies allow us to do something a little bit more tailored, a little bit more targeted. You know, there's all different ways. We, we spoke about this a little bit earlier, Adam, on, well, if we can go in and we can target a gene right for drug resistance that's currently there we're able to help a segment of the population. So I think we're just going to continue to whittle and move, and we're going to see transitions in medicine right now in the next three to five and 10 years that are just going to be like moving really from a flip phone to an iPhone, right? 
and so we'll it's, just it's, never it's, look it's, back. it's going to be that big of a of a change from where we're at today to where medicine's going to be. Well, we've been listening to uh, Deborah Morat. Um, she's been uh, entrepreneur in residence, Cortado Ventures, currently CEO of Corixer Therapeutics. Um, we're net, right now we're going to transition to the live segment of our broadcast. Stay tuned next week for a continuation of this interview with uh, Deborah Morad. And we're going to get into uh, all sorts of things that are happening here in Oklahoma in, in the biotech space and continuing to get to know uh, Deb in a, in a more personal way. Thanks for joining us. <laughs>